Welcome into the KSO show. Mason Voth, Derek Young, Drew Galloway here with you. We're all here having the time of our lives. Two thirds of the show has power today. One of them doesn't. And I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna say who it is. And everybody's just gonna have to make their guesses on who doesn't have it based on how the show goes, uh, unless something slips up at one point or another, which is fine. Uh, it's, we don't have to keep it a secret, but I do think that's a fun little guessing game for everybody. So uh, we'll we'll do that. Uh, it is a Thursday, February 8th, so we are here to talk about the Big 12, the best basketball league in America, the worst officiated league in America, though, based on uh, recent headlines, coaching and athletic director statements, reports in the media. Uh, maybe that's where we should start talking about the Big 12, because not only is it that you know we had Mac Rhodes, the AD at Baylor, get a $25,000 fine because he went to the podium after the, the Baylor win over Iowa State where Scott Drew got ejected uh, and had some kind words. There was a CBS report that for the first time ever this year, Big 12 refs in the Big 12 doing those games are actually getting graded now, which seemed a little strange that it had just become a practice now. Uh, what do we make of the officiating in this league? Which, by the way, in four straight games now, Iowa State has faced a coach that has gotten a technical foul, which is just an odd streak to uh, be on. Yeah, and who are those coaches? But Tang, Self. Tang, Self, Drew. Scott Drew. And, oh, Rodney Terry. And Rodney Terry, yep. Yeah, Rodney Terry just got a technical the other night on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we had Rodney Terry getting a technical and Kelvin Sampson <laughs> getting ejected, basically – he went straight from zero text to two text. You better leave the floor. He got he got his money's worth. It's funny because a lot of these, I think, have been coaches box stuff. Is what they're really trying to stress all of a sudden for some reason when that's never been stressed and no one stays in that like. And, and the coaches box is like eight feet. It's not even that big. So um, to, it's weird. But Kelvin Sampson, he probably earned his. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't even pretend to stay in the coaches box. He basically took a beeline to the baseline where that official was and, and just went nuts on him. Um, he's probably the only one that really, really earned uh, what he received, um, which is funny uh, because they were also up by 23 points at the time. So uh, well, his frustration was pretty well good. there. He, he said, eh, you know, you uh, I, I need night. to make a statement about officiating. Tonight is the night. Yeah. So I just think the amount of – frustration from the coaches that is seeping through via technicals and ejections. Those Scott Drew's ejection is very, very weak. Um, kind of tells the story of where they think this thing is at at the moment. Yeah. I, the officiating has never really been great, but now you're seeing more teams just being physical. And I don't think it's really a coincidence that Iowa state seems to be in the middle of all this because of how they play in their style of play that it's very conducive to what, what are you going to get officiating wise for me? The bigger story is like, how is the big 12 the only league that didn't grade officials until this? Like, how does that just happen? And by the way, all these complaints that we have or, or that coaches are having or that ADs are having, it seems to be occurring once they started grading the officials. So it's, it's true. You know, so some of it you got to say is, is this the officials just doing what they are told essentially, or what they are asked to emphasize or address? I think that's probably a part of it where, I mean, we, we see it every year where at the beginning of seasons, there's a new emphasis on rules. And so everybody's really strict about implementing it. And so they're probably like, well, I, you know, I got to I got to do this to, to look good for the league. It's just like in football. Do you remember like two or three years ago when it seemed like every single play they were stopping afterwards and telling somebody to go to the sideline to fix their knee pads? And I mean, we saw K-State play 13 football games last year. Did not hear that happen one time. Right. Like I and you know, I was at an additional game this year. Like right. never happened. The, yes, the flop warning is a great one because uh, it has not been called once this year. So, uh, yeah, they, they've, I guess, learned from their mistakes there. But 
It's obviously been a problem, and I think now we have all these pieces of evidence of all these other coaches having issues with it, and it's it all varies on how and why there's a problem with these guys. Like I think Jerome Tang, the technical at Iowa State, now he didn't – looking at the video from it, he probably didn't deserve one for what he did. But I think most of Jerome Tang's issues with the Iowa State game was like just basic game management by the officials. Like he wanted to talk to him when the Iowa State stuff was going down and, you know, they wouldn't listen to him. And there were other points in the game where it, like it just didn't make sense. And I think like Jerome Tang, I, I can understand why he would be so frustrated with officiating right now is because at various points this season, he has been told one thing and then three games later, the opposite of that has happened. So, like the yeah. first half, like I oh, can't review a clock thing in the first half. That that happened in, in Ames, right? And mm -hmm. then at Oklahoma State, they reviewed something with the clock in the first half. W within uh, the first twenty seconds, they reviewed something in the first <laughs> half. Yeah, and there was another <laughs> one too that the alley oop. Oh, the alley oop. Yeah, foul. perfect. Yeah, when K State got fouled on alley oop, not a shooting foul. When they fouled someone else on an alley oop, all of a sudden it was a shooting foul. And now we're learning that it's a shooting foul every time now, but it just wasn't that one time in Lubbock because KU with Hunter Dickinson had that a couple times. And we're like, is that a shooting foul? Because we, you just don't know anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah. he got his off of like rebounds where he was catching the ball. And they're like, oh, he's shooting. No, he's <laughs> catching. <laughs> yeah. The, so. uh, there, there are definitely some issues and some uh, discrepancies right now with the way uh, that officiating is going, and the coaches are voicing their displeasure. Yeah, um, and two things here. First, from a, on a serious level, part of it, I think, with this officiating, especially in the Big 12, because they see the we see these officials quite often, is guys, and I'll, I'll literally say names too, and they're not the only ones, but like guys like Jerry Pollard and Gary Maxwell that are aging so much that they can't keep up with the pace of the game. So they're missing calls I've, too. I've said this for not, a long time because they're not in position to make the call because they can't get up and down the floor. I think that's a as good of a <coughs> excuse me as big of a problem as anything. Secondly, I did get a laugh because I rewatched the Kansas State Iowa State game, and of course I watched the Baylor Iowa State game. Not sure if it was the same announcers, but like the, when Jerome Tang got his technical, someone's like, "Well, he, maybe he said the, the magic word," and then. And then when Scott Drew got his, it says, well, maybe Scott Drew said something. Like the announcers are just trying to figure out any reason of why these guys got a technical foul. And I'm sitting here like, you apparently don't know Jerome Tang and Scott Drew. They, they, they could yell and get very, very mad. They are not going to say the magic word. Yeah, I, I'm no. not sure those guys even know that what the magic word is. If somebody was like, hey, what's the magic word? Like, I, I could not tell you. That's uh, like, that's it's uh, I'll, for those that, maybe don't understand those two. It's like ex expecting Colin Klein to cuss. He's not going to do it. <laughs> yes, that's a, yeah. that's, a, that's a good way to, to explain it to people. You know, m maybe if, uh, like, I'm trying to think of who a, a good example would be to just kind of let it fly. Uh, I mean, like, if Mike Gundy was over there and you're like, <laughs> yeah, I could see that guy saying the magic word. Uh, it's certainly not from Jerome Tang or Scott Drew, but... I don't know how, uh, what the what the the maneuver is to get this fixed because I think this is probably one of those deals like kind of what we just talked about. You're going to deal with this all season long, and then next year, some of these emphases and everything else that goes on, it, it's just it's not going to even be a problem because they're going to forget that they were supposed to call it, and they're going to realize that it wasn't good for the game. My, like my yeah, my, my guess is Kelvin Sampson knew what the magic word was. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably a good point. That is a guy that is probably well aware of what the magic word is the, uh, the and, and is not afraid there. to use it. The, the other one to me that's kind of crazy, like I get that when it ha was happening is something. But you look at what Scott Drew did and you look at what Jerome Tang did, Bill Self was at like half court with 15 seconds to go in overtime, and that's just nothing. Yes, but, but Scott Drew takes like two steps out of the coach's box and gets the second tee. Yeah, that was weird. And I guess the the one thing that they could say with it is that there was like a timeout called. So maybe like, you know, they were but I, that was odd, too. It was one of those where it's like if you're making all these things happen, you probably should have done it there. But uh, it it is what it is. And uh, life moves on and we've got actual games to talk about. It was a weird week in the Big 12. Only. 
five midweek games. So we had four teams in the league that did not play in the middle of the week. They kind of got their little rest period. For K-State, it comes next week. So after the BYU game, which is probably good timing for them, they get a full week off from the late tip, the road trip to the mountains. They get back home. You sit and you don't play again until Saturday against TCU at home, uh, which that's an 11 a.m. tip off. So uh, early morning tip on a Saturday for the Cats and Frogs. And as we know from past years, TCU has been a very physical team. I think they're less physical this year, um, but in the past you would have gone, yeah, you're not going to get bullied right after a tight game. You know, like last year the turnaround was TCU to KU, but K-State handled it well. Uh, Here's a look at the five games that did take place this week in the Big 12. K-State and KU, they played a tight one, as we know, in overtime. Iowa State, uh, they held the lead for most of that game and kind of stretched it at one point, but Texas was able to make it tight in the end. But Iowa State hangs on for a massive win. And now, I mean, I was already taking Iowa State seriously, uh, but I think that they have to be considered legit contenders for the Big 12 title right now, uh, especially since they already have a win against Houston in hand who blew out Oklahoma State. They were up 20 when Kelvin Sampson got ejected with like 15 minutes left in the second half. Uh, Baylor beats Texas Tech, so the Red Raiders are sputtering. And then Oklahoma bashed BYU uh, in Norman, 82-66. to So that game was never really close. So what are the thoughts from the midweek games we saw in the Big 12 this week? Well, first off, I think Kelvin Sampson, I think Drew already made the joke, but he just was like, you know what, this game's over. I want to go home. So that, that's probably there. I, I hate to say it, but the way that the week unfolded makes me a little bit more pessimistic for K-State's chances in Provo on Saturday because that's that's what you, what people would call what a KU hangover, you know, that, that tends to happen at times for teams, and, and K-State could certainly be guilty of that, especially with the way that their season has unfolded this year, and they've kind of been susceptible to those types of things, whether they're looking ahead or not taking the team seriously enough or any of those things. And then, and then you got a get-right game for BYU because they got blasted by almost 20 points to Oklahoma, um, something that they probably were not anticipating uh trying to remember here everything that was kind of going through my head oh jerome or jerome tank scott drew finally beats one of his coaches got the win over grant mccaslin so uh beats one of his former assistants he had been struggling to do so he obviously hasn't defeated jerome tang just yet i think he's 0 three against tang at this point and then finally i'm not going to take anything away from iowa state you went on the road in the big 12 it's always impressive right and you're right, they are Big 12 title contenders at this point. Anyone is uh, fooling themselves if they still think they're not. On the flip side, Texas is the weirdest team in the Big 12 this year. I, they are the only team in the Big 12 that has a winning record on the road. So if they were just doing what everyone else was doing at home, they would be first place in the Big 12. But they're not. Texas is 1-4 at home in the Big 12 in a year where it's as difficult as it has ever been to win on the road. Yeah, it, Texas is a team that just makes no sense with the rest of the league. Uh, the thing that kind of concerns you about Iowa State is that their their road wins, they've jumped out to big leads and have just watched them kind of dissolve. A little, but uh, to what like Mason said too on Iowa State, and I'll, I'll stretch it out even further in terms of their Big 12 title chances, they already have a win under their belt against Houston. They already have a win under their belt against Kansas, and they don't have to go to Lawrence. And Mason's right, it, it, and we joked about it on 3 Mall uh, earlier this week too. Iowa State fans were are still like upset that they don't get the liberty or opportunity to go to Lawrence. Well, you not going to Lawrence this year might make you the Big 12 champion. So yeah. uh, if, if Kansas State didn't have to go to Lawrence, I think their fans would throw a parade and say, hell yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Um, so that, that game kind of stands out to me. Uh, the one thing that really kind of jumped out to me about the BYU in Oklahoma game is that BYU just struggled to get three pointers off. Like we know that they like to launch threes, but there was a long time in that game where Oklahoma had actually taken more threes than BYU had. So mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see how case eight defends that. I'll say this about Oklahoma. Cause I have, I still don't think they're as good as what their rankings have been and all of that, but that team could play freaking defense this year. Yes. 
Yeah, look, I think one of the things, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, D.Y., like being a little more concerned about K-State's trip to BYU now that they're coming off that type of game. But, you know, K-State's defense, we saw it the best it's been in a long time on Monday against KU because they they caused some of the same things to happen in that game, like, you know, preventing KU from getting many good looks. And now a lot of them center around – like Johnny Furphy on the outside, and he had an all-time bad game for a guy that had been going really well recently. But I think the win and the way the offense is playing and now the fact that you are back in the win column and have momentum, you might be able to to get some of that defense reinserted. I really don't know what to expect from the game on Saturday for K-State. In the grand scheme of things, obviously a win would be massive for the Cats. I don't know how much it means if they go out there and lose. Because as we've kind of discussed, you're five and five in the Big 12 right now. You have four home games remaining. Um, you can beat any of those four teams. If you do that, you give yourself a good case to be in the NCAA tournament as at least a nine and nine team. And then you would hope that you go and you steal a game somewhere on the road. So you have at least one other road win on your resume. Uh, Cincinnati probably seems like the best option Texas. out of those. Texas. Texas. Yeah, good point. Texas, they might just give it to you. Uh, the way they've played down there, like DY mentioned, so I think it's I think it's going to be interesting to see how things play out uh, over yeah. the next month. Yeah, because I agree. I've said it all along, or, or at least all week since the KU win, is that you probably still would like to steal one more road game. And I agree with BYU probably not being the barometer that I would judge this team by if they were to lose, because well, that's probably the second toughest road game left. That and KU right after KU, right? Because if you're talking about stealing a road game, you're probably pointing to Cincinnati or Texas. Yeah. I, I also just don't know what to expect because I'm still not a big believer on BYU being like that high in both the net and in Ken Palm. Oh, yeah. They're, they're not one of the 10 best teams in America. But no. Here we are. <laughs> but but like that's where like if you do steal that game, that's where you shoot up in the net rankings on the road. Yeah, that, I mean, that is true. Uh, there, And I know we'll get to it more when we actually do our preview show. But there, there is a few things that would suggest that, you know, they always talk about the NCAA tournament kind of being about matchups, right? That's why BYU was able to handle Iowa State because Iowa State likes to drill teams in the paint. Well, BYU is perfectly fine not going in the paint. They would rather just – shoot 53s a game and never shoot a layup or, or, or mid-range jumper, and it's not their game. But Iowa State's defense basically is structured so that BYU gets to do everything they want offensively. BYU smacks Iowa State around. Probably the only team that's done so in the Big 12 this year. It's all about matchups. This one's a little almost unfavorable to K-State at times because, in ways, because we talked about it. K-Shooter Score fan was the first one to really emphasize this, and it's really played out in every game since, free throws, right? Free throw rate has been really the biggest tell between a win and a loss for Kansas State this season. They they just beat KU. They handled them at the free throw line. They also did well in keeping KU off the offensive glass. One problem is BYU does, does like the offensive rebound. They're one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country. But on the other hand, BYU is in the 300s in free throw rate. So when you're talking about a team – that is kind of built or plays to a way that might be conducive to a K-State win, it is a little bit BYU because they don't do well um, in terms of getting to the free throw line. So that favors Kansas State. And I know that they slipped up for a little bit of a stretch there, but uh, we talked about it from 95%, 90 to 95% of the season. K-State's good at defense and especially on the three-point line. Yeah, no, that I, I there are things to like about what K State could do against BYU. It is tough though, like when a team shoots as much as BYU does from three, I think it helps your offensive rebounding chances because you're going to get better, better for the offense type of bounces where it can be a little bit more weird and uh, and things. But uh, K State made a good step in the right direction, so we'll kind of see. Uh, how that goes. Here's a look at the Big 12 standings as they currently sit going into the weekend. K-State back to 5-5 five and five and 500, so they are tied for 7th with Oklahoma 
And then the teams just ahead of them, a couple at five and four because they've already had their off weeks. And then KU all by themselves in fourth. And then the teams in the top three, uh, a half game back of Houston is Baylor and Iowa State. So I, I would imagine the way things are set up right now, everybody here is still probably going with Houston to win the league. But is there a case to be made for any of the three teams behind them that you like them better than the Cougars to get the job done? Two teams there, I think. I, I, KU's, I, it's stupid to count KU out, but you've, you've made it a point all year that you won't, but you've also made it a point to talk about the schedule that they have to play. Like they have probably the toughest remaining schedule of those teams, I would imagine. So um, just based off what we thought before the year, I haven't really looked at it again. So I, I think it gets a little dicey for KU, and they've also proven to be one of the worst teams in the league on the road. So um, I think personally, KU probably lost the Big 12 when they couldn't win at West Virginia and UCF. I think that probably is what did them in ultimately because in KU teams in the past don't lose those games. They they don't. That I don't even think West Virginia was themselves yet, and they still lost that game. So Correct. Yeah, that, that, that's really disappointing. Black eye for the Jayhawks. Now Baylor, I kind of feel the opposite about just because of the way that they are trending. They they already went through their tough stretch, right? Where they they had like all three of their losses were consecutive in in heartbreaking fashion. Like they basically lost in the worst way possible three times in a row, and now it just feels like that's a team that could get hot and just ride the ride the wave the the rest of the way. So I. Just because of the the hot streak factor, I would give Baylor a shot, and I'll give Iowa State a shot because of their remaining schedule, and they just keep winning. Like it's never exactly pretty, and they jump out to big leads and then try to hang on for dear life. Or, you know, they the way they won against K State is a little bit differently too. That Hilton call seems a tough place to win at. Iowa State's shown toughness on the road. I think you'd be foolish to count out Iowa State at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think both Baylor and Iowa State have pretty good arguments. Baylor's nine points away right now from being 9-0 and in the league, which is crazy to think about. That, like, if they stole one of those, that we'd be talking about how they are probably right there with Houston instead of being, like, a step back. And but, I don't, I don't, I don't think those two teams have played yet, and that'll be interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that'll be a really interesting game. But I, I also think, though, that even though Houston has been pretty vulnerable on the road, too, that they might end up running away with this thing. Well, so Houston, here's the here's what, a, what, what you, I, I think is going to be weird about them. We are halfway through Big 12 play now, but I still think like the, the wear and tear of this schedule will catch up with them, and you basically have to ask yourself, I think it comes down to Baylor and Iowa State for who can challenge them right now. Unless, I mean, because look, I, I believe in in KU and in what we've seen. Like historically, we know that KU is a team that you should never count out, and I I try to do that for as long as I can. But like I've known all year, they are a flawed team. They have issues that would suggest they can't get this done, and they're going to have to go and win some games that, as of now, they have not been winning. Like road games, they have not been winning. And they still have to go uh, on the road to Houston. They have to go to Baylor. So they have all these games left. For Baylor, though, they do have two games with KU. And they have road trips left to West Virginia, BYU, and Texas Tech, and TCU. So a lot of road games there. But they play Houston on February the 24th. So two That's weeks from now, they get, they get Houston at home. That might be the pivotal game in deciding this because I think if Houston wins that game, then I'm not sure anybody's going to touch them because not only is it you taking a game on Baylor, but also the fact that I don't know that Iowa State, although good and, and kind of scary to me, uh, I don't know that they're going to be good enough to get wins like that to keep treading water with Houston. But I think it's all about the schedule attrition for Houston. They're used to playing in the American – how much wear and tear does this league take on you over the next eight games? Yeah, if you're Iowa State, though, you could benefit because you just kind of laid out. Houston, Baylor, and KU could just beat the hell out of each other the next month. 
So, yeah. I mean, you might you might get uh, a b- break there. It was funny to me when you brought up those the standings there and where everyone is kind of at the moment, and you see BYU sitting there at ninth in the Big Twelve, even behind K State because they're four and five in the conference. This is, wh- and I have a bone to pick with the net a lot, and and uh, everyone kind of went after uh, Terrence Oglesby. They call him To on yes. the field of sixty eight <laughs> because he had some Big Twelve hate. But his logic was not flawed. He had a bone. He had he went and he attacked it from the right angle. And to be honest, he probably has a little bit of a point, especially since Kansas is in Kansas and Baylor was scuffling a little bit at the time. So I and I think he's the best guy that's on their podcast network. Personally, I really enjoy listening to him. But here's the and here's the kind of where I'm going boring. with that. BYU is ninth in the Big Twelve or tied for ninth in the Big Twelve. Actually, they're the tenth team listed on the standings right there that you have. They are number nine in the net, but they're but there's nine Big Twelve teams better than them in the standings right now. It's just bizarre to me, and it's why I do think moving forward they have to do some things about the net that, because of the way that you can manipulate it and the way that it's wrong. I mean, I think Xavier what they I don't know if they won last night, but there was two they twelve. They, they were yeah. Were they playing Villanova? Yeah, yeah, yeah and okay. Villanova just I mean. Yeah, didn't even get a shot off on the last possession. That, that was the most brutal thing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. well, still really the, the, high. The, the, those two teams played each other last night, and they were twelve and ten, but both are like good enough to be. You know, I think what top fifty in the net right now. It's like mm-hmm. it's bizarre. Yeah, and, at, I, at some point, like we need to get back to to wins and losses do matter. Uh, and actually, I, I'll give. Xavier, uh, some some props. They have been actually a little bit better lately than I thought, but they lost a ton of non-con games. Um, and like, look, K State. I'm not bar- barking and saying that they deserve a ton better treatment, but at the end of the day, where the net keeps pu- pushing them down into like the seven, the high 70s and low 80s range, they're better than that with the yeah. way that things have gone and, and the way that they've shown it. And I don't, I mean, again, like these are numbers, so I don't know how you make this problem get fixed, uh, but the net is flawed. And I'll, I'll, I'll add this real quick too, and then I'll let you guys take back over here. But like Terrence Oglesby, he was, he had a correct point. The problem is, is that the way that it comes out and the way it comes, it's like, oh, you're trying to say that the Big 12 isn't the best. Well, they are. The point is not that the Big 12 isn't the best conference. Uh, I think it gets lost though with all these people. They want to celebrate the downfall of the big 12. And be like, well, it's not as good as it has been. Look at these teams. Every other league in America also sucks and is down this year. College basketball as a whole this season is just really not that great. No, I agree. Uh, and the big 12 is still the best conference. No yeah. doubt about it. I'm not sure it's even close. So I, I was it. And I don't even know that he was trying to say anything essentially negative about the big 12. It's just that, he thought maybe their perceived reputation was getting inflated a bit this year, and it probably is to an extent. Um, but two other examples that really bother me too, um, at least in comparison to K-State, because I don't think K-State's that much different than these teams. Like I said, BYU is like number eight or number nine in the net. Do mm-hmm. any of you? Do either of you think BYU is one of the eight or nine best teams in the country? No, there's no, not a soul. No. If there's a soul on earth that thinks BYU is one of the eight or nine best teams in the country, he's probably – Mark watching Pope. our show from his house in Provo, Utah, right? So, <laughs> Drew, I don't even think Mark Pope believes that they are one of the 10 best teams in the country. Yeah, well, I don't – Mark Pope doesn't like a lot of things. He's kind of just kind of a curmudgeon a little bit in that way, I would say. Uh, and then Cincinnati. The, like, it's awesome because it's going to be an easy quad one opportunity for K-State when they go there. But are they number 30 in the net? Come on. Yeah, that that might be a little favorable to uh to the Bearcats there. Although I do think that they're weird though. Like that's another one where at the right. end of the day, like winning and losing should have a bigger impact here because, like, I think they fight in a lot of games, but how many of them do they end up winning? Uh, exactly, and that's kind of a big deal. And Villanova, because, go ahead. Villanova is like one game above five hundred, and they're in the top fifty. Yeah, yeah. but. And for since for it, well, because they it, have a good loss to K State on the resume, <laughs> yeah. For Cincinnati, it's like, should they really be 45 spots ahead of K State? No, yeah, nope. I, I, I totally agree with uh, with the sentiment there, and I guess we'll just kind of have to see uh, what, what comes about at, when it all finalizes. Like, I, I keep telling myself, hey, 
uh, you know, we, we got a long ways to go. Net gets better yeah. as the season wears on. We got like a month left until the season ends, though. And I, I don't know that I think the net, this might be the most criticized it's gotten this year. Now, especially since people realize, OK, we can't really say anything uh, with, you know, everything else. K-State did move up one spot in the net last night. Uh, so they're up to 76 now. It's funny. Uh, beating KU made K-State jump up after that game four spots in the net from 83 to 79 they've almost moved up the same amount of spots by not playing the last two nights <laughs> uh ucf is 11 spots better in the net than k-state <laughs> how do we feel about that one well they beat ku in texas but k-state beat ku too yeah, so, yeah. and they beat ucf by a thousand uh yeah could have been more than that uh yeah here's here's another good one for you uh the the pit panthers they are 61 in the net uh, if that's of interest to anybody. Um, some of these other teams, it, here's the thing. You find a lot of teams that if you went and looked at how they're doing, similar seasons to K-State. Okay, non-con, treading water in conference play. The issue is, and I get that K-State has had a lighter, non, a lighter conference schedule than some already, but really at this point, that's not the case. They've played at Iowa State. They've played at Houston. They've played at Texas Tech. They've beaten Baylor. They've beaten Kansas. Like, at this point, K State has played teams in this league. Uh, they played a ranked Oklahoma team when they saw them. Like at this stage of the game, I, I think that K State. It's weird that they're not getting the the bump that they need. But again, we talked about it, and I I think I talked about this with with Drew. But there's really no purpose in the future for teams to schedule good non conferences in basketball, just like in football, because the way that Iowa State and BYU pumped up their numbers this year was because they just kicked the crap out of really bad teams. Now, K-State had that opportunity, and they did not come through on it. Uh, so, you know, it's a little tough to make that point. But overall, yeah. I think generally that's something to, to kind of keep in mind going forward. I, yeah, no, that I mean, K-State lost their opportunity to do so when they played North Alabama, Chicago State, Oral Roberts. My only issue is, is like, are, do, are we really going to say Iowa State and BYU are like 70 spots better than K-State because two or three months ago they beat worse teams worse? I, that just seems weird. <laughs> the good, uh, you know, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, they, they beat the bad teams bad, and we're supposed to just believe that that actually means something. So, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird deal, and I Especially, think we're going to be watching K-State fight it all year and kind of have to sweat things out. Well, yeah, you know, K State should get more credit for the North Alabama and an uh, Oral Roberts wins, right? Because those came in overtime. I mean, eleven and zero that helped pad the eleven and zero stat. Beat them the same way they beat KU and Baylor and Villanova <laughs> and Providence. I mean, maybe we just don't know how good North Alabama and Oral Roberts are. I that's there a good go. point. I mean, everybody told me that I didn't know that when I I criticized the uh, how bad K State played in those games. So I think you're probably onto something there, Dy. For, uh, for for those that have missed it, I'm being sarcastic. I, I think North Alabama is like in the bottom third of their own league right now. So uh, yeah, they're they're really not good. Uh, but or, it, Oral Roberts might be okay. I think, but yeah, yeah. Oral so Oral Roberts and South Dakota State have both ended up playing better than what like th uh, originally looked at the time they've they've pumped things up a little bit uh north, north alabama did not i mean actually i no. think central arkansas is in that same league i think central uh, arkansas is better no central well i i have i'm not looking at their league standings but net ranking wise central arkansas is 344th in the country oh, so well i think really but i think they have a winning record in their league i was looking at it last night i believe so uh, that that seems like something that could be a possibility with uh what are they where where are they at now? Because they just changed leagues, I'm pretty sure. And I got in trouble for this early in the year because I was trying Is it the to, Southern? The Southern, maybe? Uh, uh the, no, I don't think so. Southland. So there's all those weird ones. Yeah, it's not South. Southland. I got in trouble with that one too. I, I don't know. I Central Arkansas. Figure it figure out your, your league affiliation. Uh get on top of it. Maybe they're they're like they're not a SWAC team, are they? They're in the A on. Oh, the okay. There you go. There you go. They're four and five in the A on. Okay. Think, not terrible. I think North Alabama's worst, right? Uh, North Alabama's uh, five and four. Five and four. They might contend for a league crown. That's not no true. Eastern Kentucky's running away with the A on. So yeah, I, 
I, I just I, I wonder. I mean, realistically, at this point, do, we talked about uh, on Sunday at least. Uh, we 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 did a game dy called nit ncaa or nothing which of the three ends do you think k-state gets now we we all kind of shifted towards saying nit for k-state uh, after the win against ku and what's up on the schedule do you have faith that anything different can happen now i do i i will wait for this team to prove to me that they can be a little bit more consistent before completely hopping onto the bandwagon so i will still probably stubbornly say in it but i have faith that because they're capable of doing what is necessary to get there because they are capable of beating the four teams remaining that they have at home that is byu iowa state tcu and west virginia they can beat all the four of those teams at home and they can steal a road game heck they could probably steal too if they can win at cincinnati and texas they're capable of that um so i have faith that they can do it but from a predictive standpoint, I would probably be stubborn and say they don't just because they haven't had the same consistency. Okay. That all makes sense. And uh, I think uh, it was probably the best place to, to leave all that. All right. Let's, uh, let's dive in real quick and uh, get ready for this weekend, which is going to be probably a, a pretty interesting slate in telling us how things go. I think there are three probably pretty easily defined as the the best games of the weekend. Uh, and then the others, you look around and it's probably, if you lose that, it's not a good sign for you. So go around and uh, everybody give your favorite game for the weekend for uh, for the Big 12. Do you do you have a, a graphic of that? Because, you know, spoiler alert, I'm the one without internet. What? <laughs> Uh, yes, I do. Let me, uh, let me throw that up there, uh, in yeah. just a moment for you. I, I, I guess we'll let Drew lead it off then since he's got the full power of the internet at his disposal. I, I mean, I, I feel like the, the easy answer probably has to be KU and Baylor college game day will be there It's a bounce back spot for KU. We just talked about how hot that Baylor has been. If there's a year to win an Allen field house, it does feel like this year could be the year for anybody because they've struggled at home recently. I know that people on uh, the board have said that K-State might lose by like 20 or 30 in Allen Fieldhouse, but like they haven't blown anybody out outside of Oklahoma State at home in Big 12. Yeah, but that, that feels like it happens a lot, and K-State still gets blown out there, so I don't really have to say. Yeah. Um, I, I, there you go, D.Y., for go. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that. You're, you're a kind soul. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, Baylor, Kansas is too obvious, so I'm going to try to go off the reservation a little bit here. You know what? Just because it's a team that's kind of built similarly and they have a lot of toughness, um, and it's you know Houston's probably in a little bit of a danger spot there at Cincinnati. I think that's something to consider. Um, Texas better not lose at home to West Virginia, right? So I already lost on the road to them. Yeah. I, I, like, I like how that game's on Longhorn Network and Mason just has it as nothing. <laughs> I'm glad you pointed that out. Yes, uh, I, I'm protesting right there. Uh, I actually, so I have a I have a folder on my computer that has all of the, the different TV networks that are even a possibility for Big 12 games to be on. And I just don't have the Longhorn Network in there. And I was like, I'm not wasting my time to go do right. this. So this is a protest. Uh, that yeah. is what's that boycott. I appreciate the boycott. So I think that West Virginia Texas game is significant just because of what the Longhorns have been doing at home. So it's a game to keep an eye on. I think Houston's a little bit of a tricky spot there at Cincinnati. Um, obviously, Baylor KU is good. Kansas State BYU. I mean, that one's pretty significant, and so is TCU Iowa State. Yeah, I think uh, so. I, I'm interested in Houston Cincinnati just because Cincinnati has played teams close at home and there's also the familiarity of these teams you know they were in the same conference prior to this year so you have a little bit of that and Houston even w when they would go on the road in the American and face some of their more challenging opponents which again it's the American so it's not like there's a ton of real challenges there but they would struggle at times like they'd come to a bad Wichita State and have a tough time they'd go to Cincinnati and struggle I wonder if Cincinnati can give them a little bit of an issue 
Uh, and so that one, that one will be interesting to me. And then the other one's Iowa State TCU because TCU let Iowa State get out to a massive lead when they first played this year in Fort Worth. TCU came all the way back to lose by a point. And now I just kind of wonder if like these teams will be due for another close game and TCU tries to get the revenge. Uh, plus they can get hot shooting the ball at times. And so they could maybe match Iowa State. Um, so I, I that might be... I mean, if you look at what Iowa State has left on the schedule, that might be Iowa State's best shot at losing a home game uh, the rest of the way. So I, I think that one will be a fun one to follow. And then obviously we'll have more on K-State BYU for everybody tomorrow. Um, but, you know, it's I, it's probably fun for a lot of people that are just like, yeah, I want more basketball and you get a Big 12 game at 9 o'clock at night. But, man, that's going to that's gonna be painful to have to try and stay up for. Yeah, I'm, I'm not looking forward to it. Uh, we're not going to Provo, obviously. But uh, we'll see what happens. We'll still have coverage of the game. And uh, our first trip to Provo will instead be for football season. Yeah, that'll be uh, that'll be a good time to, uh, mm -hmm. to see. Uh, if if you had to pick one game here that uh, you just you're not going to watch at all, uh, which one is it and why? Because for me, it's uh, Bedlam at 6 o'clock. I will not be watching that game. And, yeah. Yeah. and it, it's not because it's on ESPN Plus, and it's not because Baylor and KU is going on at the same time. It's because I just flat do not care about what goes on in that game. I never care about that yeah. basketball game. That's never consequential. No, no, no not, it's not consequential. It's never consequential. I'm not going to go out of my way to watch Oklahoma State play basketball the rest of this year anyway. <laughs> Um, regardless of who the opponent is. You, uh, there's probably a little bit of an argument for UCF at Texas Tech um, because I don't know if I'll get around to that one a whole lot either because I'll probably be more tuned in to Houston at Cincinnati, but I'll still probably give it a passing glance just to see if the Red Raiders can kind of snap out of their funk. Yeah. Uh, good weekend for the Big 12 to only have two games on ESPN+. Plus. They dominate ESPN2 during the day. And I guess if for some reason you have the Longhorn Network, congrats on being able to watch West Virginia, yeah. Texas. But yeah. honestly, that's a good PR move for Texas because I was trying to find their game earlier this week to watch them lose to Iowa State. And I was like, oh, I'm just not going to be able to watch it because uh, it's on the Longhorn Network. Yeah, I'd say the games that uh, I just have no interest in, Bedlam, because Oklahoma State is so bad and I just don't want to watch them anymore. We've already had to watch them twice in person. Yeah. That's enough for me. And then uh, Texas, West Virginia, because, you know, screw them. Longhorn Network. Yep. Screw the man. Get get the Longhorn Network out of here. <laughs> last last days uh, coming up that we have to deal with or, or worry about that. Uh, I will say, I you know, speaking of bedlam and basketball, uh, ladies' bedlam over the weekend was pretty wild. Uh, we got to see part of that because, I mean, what just – I, maybe this was good planning on their part. It seems terrible uh, from my standpoint. They tipped off Oklahoma State, Oklahoma women at 4 o'clock on Saturday. And so less than an hour after K-State and Oklahoma State played a men's game, they were just like, yeah, everybody stay, can stay in your same seats until somebody comes by and says they have a ticket for it. Uh, Bedlam's coming up in like 30 minutes. It's like, gee, many Christmas. And yeah, so I, it was a mess in that I, building and loud and just uh, – a true doubleheader of men and women. It was crazy. Like, And usually when you get the doubleheader, the women play first. So that's interesting. Yeah, and like, you know, in the past, like, I get that for non-conference games. You're like, yeah, well, let's just double down here. And people are cool with it because it's like a Friday night, whatever. You're doing this for conference games? I mean, come on. I Now, I will say, if like the Big 12 ever in the future was like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to make the men and the women play identical <clears throat> schedules to each other. And so if the men are, are on the road here, so are the women. And then you maybe get to double down a little bit more. That would maybe make some sense to me. I'm sure somebody's sitting around going, well, there are a lot of logistical problems with that. And I'm like, you're probably right. But that's the only way that makes sense. It did not make sense to do Oklahoma, Oklahoma State women less than an hour after K-State and Oklahoma State ended uh, over the weekend. So, the, Which, by the, the way, I Oklahoma ended up winning. So the Oklahoma State Cowgirls are not good for anything. <laughs> they blew a giant halftime lead to not help out the K-State women. So, uh, yeah, all they're, get them out of here. Emily the, Ebert, traitor, gone. <laughs> get her out of here. Jay-Z Hoyt, traitor, get her out of here, gone. Worthless. Cowgirls are worthless. I will say that uh, 
Oklahoma State, no manners. Um, because oh. you know, no manners at all. Because it's ladies first, and they made them play after. Oh, good point. That's a good spin zone. Mike Holder, gone. Out of here. Get out of here. So everybody associated with Oklahoma State, just a bad weekend all around. Now I, I think Mike Holder's been gone, right? Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying that he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. <laughs> I don't think so. But he yeah, no, he is been, gone. Yeah, it's been Chad Weiberg, former K State guy, since 2019. Man, that's, why? Why did I? Why did I still think that um, Mike Holder was there? I don't know. That kind of took me for a loop. I was like, Mason just brought up the AD from Actually, five years ago. You know what? You know what it is. Uh, since I got there so early on Saturday, I walked around their little Heritage Hall thing for a long time, and I was looking at all the different things. And so I was reading their golf section forever. Uh, and so I still just had that, you know, stuck in my head and everything for uh, him being the goat of golf in yeah, the West, that, but. That's bizarre. Yeah, he was last AD in 2019, and you you Damn. you you're blaming him for something in 24. Well, I still I still feel good about blaming him uh, for <laughs> for how things went down there. Uh, when you when you when you're not serious about your takes like that, you can you can throw anybody under the bus. So I mean, I Pistol Pete gone. Get him out of here. Eskimo Joe. Oh, I probably saw offensive. Pistol. Get him out of here. <laughs> I saw your Pistol Pete tw- tweet. Actually, didn't take off his hat for the national anthem. Yeah, yeah. what's that about? Does he not respect <laughs> this country? I mean, I, I would figure somebody that loves the Second Amendment as much as Pistol Pete would <laughs> respect the country he lives in, but apparently not. Left his hat on, uh, so I don't know. Just things to make you think about Oklahoma State and uh, how they handle their business down there. They don't like uh, the country or women. Okay, yeah. <laughs> wow, that, and that's tough. That's that's a tough that's a tough spot to be in. So. Uh, not trying to slander the, the, the great Cowboys and Cowgirls that are out there, but uh, this episode's taking a turn towards the end. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with a BYU K-State preview as the Cats hit the road, try to get back above 500 in league play, talk about some other things that go on with that, uh, and then more serious manners over at kstateonline.com where you can get tons of recruiting updates from Drew. He's been killing it with that. Lots of different guys that have been in lately and that K-State's been talking with, uh, trying to set up 2025 and beyond. And then still plenty of basketball as uh, life has been reinvigorated into the K-State season. So we will do that. We will get out of here because we've been going for about 50 minutes and uh, my wife has decided it's a good time to call me. So we are out of here. We will be back in a little bit and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. For Drew Galloway, Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Uh, Thanks for watching K-State Online.